Thanks for having me. Um, so I, you know, I know that uh, many people have been thinking a lot in recent days about 1972. And why that is is because that was a year when a lot of things happened in America, um, a lot of things that uh, mostly get known as Watergate. Um, and been, but also out of that period came a lot of very significant reforms. Reforms to our democracy and strengthening the rules. But I want to take you back a year before that to 1971 because it lays the stage for how the forces on the right were actually preparing and planning how they could undo, undo any of those kinds of reforms even before they had happened. So in 1971, there was a, there's a man named Lewis Powell, and some of you are probably familiar with him, especially lawyers. Um, he was not yet a justice on the Supreme Court. He was still a tobacco lawyer. Worked for Big Tobacco. He was in Richmond, Virginia, on the board of Philip Morris. Uh, and most importantly, he was very active with the Chamber of Commerce, where he served on a number of committees and chaired their so-called education committee. So now Lewis Powell. He saw what was happening in America, and at this time, there was you know, the rise of the environmental movement. Uh, and actually, Seattle and, and, and the Northwest is, is to a great extent to thank for things like Earth Day. Uh, but there was also Americans across the country were rising up and protesting uh, excessive corporate pollution, and uh, Nixon actually signed into law the National Environmental Policy Act, Nixon, actually created the EPA. Congress passed the first air pollution standards. And in the courts, a famous lawyer named Ralph Nader was actually having some successes at beating, beating uh, the big car companies uh, in litigation who had put incredibly dangerous vehicles on the road. And he started winning lawsuits for, for consumers and Americans who were harmed by dangerous products. Lewis Powell thought this was a very scary time for capitalism. Lewis Powell was sure that the free market was in great danger. So Lewis Powell he got out his pen, well, actually got out his typewriter, and he typed a fairly lengthy memo to his colleagues at the Chamber of Commerce, and he laid out a plan on how to fight back. And I would actually recommend that you read this document. It's called the Powell Memo. It's not a very creative title, but it's easy to remember. Um, and it's, uh, you can find it easily. It's, it's on, uh, there's a, you just type it in, you'll get, you'll get, a, you'll grow right to his archives. And you can read, it's about 35, 40 pages, but it is just jaw dropping because he laid out the entire plan that has created the conservative roadmap for the past many decades. So what he said was, in order to control public policy making, we need to control and fund, we need to build and fund institutions that will control the levers of power. So that means the courts, the legislatures, and the media. For this plan to be successful, said Lewis Powell, quote, we need careful, long-range planning and implementation, consistency of action over an indefinite period of years, a scale of financing available only through joint effort. And remember, he's talking to corporate America in the chamber, so there is a scale of financing, you know, that is very hard to meet on, from the other side. But he's a scale of financing available only through joint effort and political power available only through united action and national organizations. Because what Lewis Powell really grasped is that policy victories come only after gaining control of the levers of power. So here's an example of how that infrastructure has worked. And as I said, they were already building an infrastructure and a response to the reforms and things that came just after he wrote this memo. So this infrastructure, the courts, electoral strategies, legal doctrine, and fake news have affected our national policies. Now, in 2008, I'm not taking you quite so far back, but do you remember the presidential candidate on the Republican side was John McCain? John McCain actually did not deny 
that human beings had a role in climate change. It wasn't actually that crazy for a Republican at the time to say that. He was not embarrassed to actually do events with scientists. But then he was challenged. And it was a combination of the right-wing funders, hackers, fake news that all combined to destroy any rational thinking. Now, not, not so surprising, the Koch brothers were a big part of this. Of course they were, right? And the Koch brothers were absolutely some of those who imbibed this Powell memo. It was a doctrine that told them how to go forward. Well, and they, you know, again, this, this you all know, right? The, the Koch brothers, they have huge investments in fossil fuels, including refineries and pipelines. So this oil money, they put into research in right-wing think tanks. Remember I said this plan was creating think tanks. So these think tanks then put out reports to discredit climate science. They funded junkets for judges. And get this, they took judges, you know, and often, ironically, they took judges to beautiful places like Yellowstone or other national parks, and they had these, you know, wonderful whining and dining, um, you know, parties where they, they brought in all the oil lobbyists and sat them next to them. They talked about pending cases, and they disputed the research. Then there were hackers who took emails from scientists, academics who were working on this and, and selectively released them to the right-wing media to discount and undermine the climate science. And then another project of theirs, as I said, legal doctrine, right? Destroying campaign finance limits, Citizens United. And once that happened, it let loose a flood of money. And the Kochs launched what the New York Times called an all fronts campaign with television advertising, social media, and cross country events aimed at electing lawmakers who would ensure that the fossil fuel industry would not have to worry about new pollution regulations. A Koch operative explained this to conservative bloggers. He said, if we win the science argument, it's game, set, match. So each piece of this, the so-called scholarship, to support the fossil fuel lobby, the attacks on science reporting, the campaign to nominate and then give good legal reasoning to susceptible judges, the legislative lobbying and electoral strategy to produce bills and to put climate deniers into elected office. Well, you know what? The Kochs got out of that a huge victory, courtesy of Donald Trump pulled America out of the climate agreement, and he is proceeding to tear down not just President Obama's environmental legacy, but everything that had been built up since President Nixon set up the EPA. Game, set, match, indeed. So now a lot of you are probably familiar with um, you know, the sort of um, famous line when Chief Justice Roberts was nominated um, to, uh, to the Supreme Court he was very solemn, and he said, you know, judges are like umpires. Umpires, they don't make the rules. No, they just apply them. You know, he said judges are completely neutral. In fact, however, anyone who follows baseball know that, knows that calling balls and strike actually depends on where the, where the ump sets the strike zone. And the right has long understood that when one team gets to both draft and apply the rules of the game, guess what? It is a lot more likely to win. So in elections, rather than just plant presenting platforms to win votes, they've stacked the deck by stripping certain voters of access to the ballot box, neutering election laws, so they can fill the airwaves with dark money funded attack ads and shaping congressional and state legislative districts to advantage their party. They've cut down on access to the courts, closing the courthouse doors to deny victims remedies for violations of core rights without having to go to the trouble of repealing those statutes. It's a lot harder to repeal statutes than just to carve out the remedies. Think of the Affordable Care Act. 
And they go after control of the court system itself by investing huge sums of money to promote or oppose judicial nominees at the federal and state levels. So very convenient that the resulting judiciary is much more amenable to pro-corporate and anti-civil rights arguments. So another example of how this has played out, take North Carolina. So also in, in 2008, Barack Obama beat John McCain in 2008. And you know, a lot of people on the progressive side recognized overall, of course, 2008 was an amazing and historic election. But North Carolina seemed like a special example. I mean, think of the history of the state. It seemed like there was a real change there. Progressive forces were on the rise. The far right seemed to be in collapse. But what people sort of forgot was that that was, the vote was really close. And we had a really charismatic candidate. And it masked how the conservative forces had plotted to hold power for the long term. So very quickly, they took it back. So 2010, actually in 2009, Karl Rove announced a plan. He very brazenly announced something called Red Map. He, he wrote about it on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, he was not hiding it. Democrats actually could have reacted to this. But what he, what he said was, red map, here's the plan. We focused on just a few of the state houses, just enough states, so where the divide in the legislature is very close, and the Democrats now control those state houses, and there's a Republican governor. And what we're going to do is we're going to surgically go in and we're going to focus on those races that we can, that we can win. We can put a lot of money in for a state race. And we're going to take over that state house. And you know what comes next? After that, redistricting. So they went in, and, and, and North Carolina, of course, was one of those states. But you all know what the other ones were, right? And Red Map gave us the Congress that we have now. You know when there's a blue wave and you, 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 you win 70% of the vote and you only get 48% of the seats, you know, whatever it is. Um, that's Red Map. But so in North Carolina, there was, a, there was, a, was, was a, 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 an example of where they were successful. Uh, much of the money that went to this effort in North Carolina came from a man named Art Pope. Washington Pope describes his family foundation as putting 55, more than $55 million into a robust network of conservative think tanks and advocacy groups, building a state version of what his dear friends, Charles and David Koch, helped create on a national level. So then they went after the governorship, and they won that back as well. So then they had the trifecta. The state house, both sides, both houses, and the governorship. And they basically went on a bender, a drunken bender of right-wing legislating to implement the policy ideas that had been generated by this empire of think tanks and policy shops funded by Art Pope and his family. So they did the usual, right? No surprise. Went after abortion rights. They went after LGBTQ rights. And they had, for their corporate partners, they allowed fracking, of course, right? First thing they got to do is let fracking happen. They curbed lawsuits against hog farms, which were polluting North Carolina in a terrible way. And despite, you know, all of their claims for local control, they preempted local jurisdictions' right to pass ordinances affecting their own residents, from raising the minimum wage to protecting transgender youth. Art Pope became the new director of the budget. Uh, who was, he was put in place by the Republican governor. But most significantly, they focused on power and locking it in. So of course what they did was they restricted the right to vote. They had a bill, it was called the Monster Bill, because it had so much packed in it. They changed their board of elections. They redrew district lines for, in favor of the Republican Party. They limited early voting, and of course, they established uh, rules for photo IDs. They made it a lot harder to register to vote. And they were really focused on making sure that, especially people of color, 
and people who vote Democratic were not going to be able to vote as easily as they had before. But he even went after judicial elections, which had, which had been historically nonpartisan in North Carolina. They made them partisan, and then they gerrymandered those two. So there was a brief respite. The federal courts put a stop to a few pieces of this. But look, they didn't fail in their plan, because we all have to do is look at 2018. It said red map, right? Red map. In 2018, a supposed wave election for Democrats was a pretty even split in North Carolina. The Democrats got a little bit less than the majority. The Republicans got a little bit more than the majority, 50.4% for the Republicans. There are 13 House seats in North Carolina. Does anybody have a guess on how many of those seats that the Democrats won with almost 49% of the vote? Not zero, okay, okay, that's even more, that's, that's a more dire, but they won three. Three out of 13. Now, the Republicans didn't quite get 10, because you might remember there was one, one of their candidates went too far, even for North Carolina, by trying to buy off absentee voters and take their ballots and write in. Anyway, it was a completely illegal. So, um, so there's one, one race that's still open. So, you know, it's possible Democrats end up with four, but, uh, you know, not, won't, don't hold your breath. Um, you know, and these kinds of efforts to suppress the vote are not new. And, you know, I often tell people, you know, who start, you know, it says we have a president who is really, um, you know, seems like he's sui generis, right? He is, we've never had anything quite like him, thank God. But there is a lot of history before him. And so when people start getting very nostalgic about Ronald Reagan, you know, it's important to <laughs> give them a little history. And here's some history. So Ronald Reagan, when he was running for president, he, he spoke at a rally for the religious uh, round table. He was the featured speaker. Uh, before he, or you know, another speaker um, who was there to get everybody excited was Paul Weyrich. Now, Paul Weyrich is somebody who was absolutely a disciple of the Powell Memo. Paul Weyrich uh, is, is, was a, is a absolutely essential part of this right-wing history. He founded you know, again, sort of following the, what the Powell Memo instructed is founding these, in, you know, these institutions that would create long-term uh, infrastructure for the right. He created the Heritage Foundation. He created ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, infamous for creating model legislation. Well, a lot of it's for voter suppression, um, anti-gun control, um, uh, anti-immigrant, um, a whole range of bad stuff, fracking. Um, uh, and he also was a founder of the Moral Majority with Jerry Falwell. So the guy was um, industrious, to say the least. But no, so he went out to talk about, about the right to vote. And he said, now many of our Christians have what I call the goo-goo syndrome, good government. You know, and he says this like, that's a terrible thing <laughs> that these people have a goo-goo syndrome. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by the majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage, our leverage in the, elect in the elections, quite candidly, goes up as the voting populace goes down. Well, Paul Weyrich did not need to explain to his audience who he didn't want to vote. And, you know, as I said, Alec, one of the groups that he founded, was the source of many of the model bills on how to do voter suppression. Voter suppression and gerrymandering have given the right the upper hand across the country. After the 2016 elections, Democrats actually hit a low in state legislatures that has not been seen since 1921. Over the course of President Obama's two terms, the Republicans added, and with a Democratic president in office, the Republicans added almost 1,000 state legislative seats, putting them in control of 30 state legislatures. And in 22 states now, they also have the governorship as well as both chambers. Because remember, that's the trifecta. But rigging elections is only part of the plan. 
It's only part of the power. The other, another piece of this is the courts. Now, Justice Powell, lawyer Powell, before he was a Supreme Court justice, he understood very much what a critical role the courts would play. And, you know, Alexander Hamilton, who many people have come to really like recently, um, you know, said a number of wise things, but he, you know, he said that the, the, he called the courts the least dangerous branch. I'm not sure that that was actually right. And what he meant, though, was, you know, that the, the, the Congress or the legislature has the purse, the executive branch has the sword, and the courts, what do they have? Well, they actually have a lot. Uh, and Justice Powell understood that. And so did the right-wing funders. And they built, in addition to the Chamber of Commerce with its litigation group, uh, the Judicial Crisis Network, the Republican State Leadership Committee, and many others put millions of dollars and have over many years into campaigning for or against judicial nominees, including most famously, perhaps, President Obama's Supreme Court nominee, Merrick Garland, and in favor of Donald Trump's nominees, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. But they play at the state level as well. And I, you know, I, it's not actually, I don't like this, but it's, it's, it would be amusing if it wasn't true. But they helped elect a, 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 a chief justice in Arkansas who was proud to say that he rules by prayer and not politics. And I guess he's not read the First Amendment. So we might send it to him. I'm not sure it make a whole lot of difference. But on the left, you know, what happened? There was very little support for Merrick Garland, certainly not financially. There was no ad campaign for Merrick Garland. People get, uh, on the left, find it very inappropriate to engage on judicial nominations and judicial elections in the same way. But what's happened is that the Chamber of Commerce and these right-wing think tanks have provided conservative judges and legislatures with model rules that they've adopted that, have, that are keeping defrauded consumers and victims of sexual harassment, injured workers, children harmed by lead out of the courtroom. Well, the Supreme Court has given a broad understanding to arbitration clauses, allowing companies to take cases that used to be in the public eye, in the precedent-setting court system, and put them in a private, non-precedent-setting, uh, precedent-setting and company-funded arbitration system. And they've pushed a legal doctrine, which has been embraced by the judges they've gotten confirmed, called originalism, that purports to put the blessings of our founders on right-wing policy goals. Donald Trump is the symbol of the success of this strategy where the evangelicals, the right wing, have embraced a philanderer and a groper because he's giving them the judges that they want who are dedicated to overturning Roe versus Wade. And along the way, of course, limiting voting rights and allowing money to flood into politics. Now, if anyone here has not been paying attention to what Donald Trump has done on the judiciary, you should you're going to find it incredibly frightening. His rate of success is eclipsing every other president in history, and I am not exaggerating. And these are for life, and they're young, and they're white, and they're male, and they're extremely, extremely right-wing, and they are aiming at Roe and many other decisions. Now, this is something that I work on these issues. Um, it used to be absolutely something that every judicial nominee, nominee on the federal level would say. Brown versus Board of Education was rightly decided. Of course it was. They're not saying that anymore. Donald Trump's nominees refuse. They say, well, we can't comment because that might come before the court. What? That was decided in 1954. They won't comment on it because it might indicate something. Well, I know what it indicates when they won't comment on it, and I think you do as well. Now, so Lewis Powell, 
he was a visionary. Now, there might have been some in corporate America who would have seen those advances in the environmental and consumer and workplace regulation as a reason to say things are changing in America, to make some kind of accommodation and maybe even to celebrate progress. Lewis Powell said no. He said, we are going to war. And they joined him. Well, the impact of this strategic thinking on the right has been devastating. Now, on the left, unfortunately, there's always some energy, but it's so diffuse. I, you know, I get we don't have a central committee on the left. It's good. That's good. I'm not advocating that we should. And I don't think that the, the left is ever going to have the kind of hierarchical, top-down system that exists on the right. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of striking, but if you look at, um, and there's, there's research that's been done on, on the right-wing philanthropy, they are completely hierarchical. You've got these big dogs, you know, the Cokes and the Mercers and the Bradleys and the Popes, several other families. They set up their family foundations, you know, the Olins. And they basically run the show. They all in, they join together, they agree what their investments are going to be, and they fund for the long term. Well, OK, we're not going to do that. It doesn't work that way on the left. But we do need some kind of a Powell memo of our own. We need an overarching strategy that focuses on winning and maintaining power, not just on issues. One that recognizes the need for large-scale and long-term investment in progressive infrastructure, in think tanks, to generate ideas in the media, to disseminate them, in lawmakers to enact them, and in judges to uphold them. But for our ideas to take hold and remain strong, I believe that we need to understand that long-term victories require locking in democracy with a small d, nonpartisan districts, broad access to the voting booth, and fair-minded judges. Now, in the short term, that's going to require some tactical partnership with the Democratic Party, getting them elected, funding their campaigns. But when legislatures become amenable to major reform, we are going to have to pressure them pressure those elected officials to make changes that are enduring and aren't subject to easy repeal with a change in party in the State House. Now, I'd like to think, um, I, ha I have worked for a number of Democrats, um, that Democrats are less likely to engage in voter suppression. But that doesn't mean that just if they, if they get elected into power that we should forget about systemic change. We will need to pressure them to enshrine the right to vote in legislation for when the Republicans come back into power. And with respect to partisan gerrymandering, well, in that case, actually, the Democrats don't have clean hands. And I you know, always, you know, there are two a few cases in front of the Supreme Court right now. One of them involves Maryland, which is actually where I live right now, just outside of DC. And there is a district that if you look at it, it's like it's been called like the pterodactyl that's falling from Annapolis towards Pittsburgh or something. And it's, you know, it it's really has these arms that stretch out and a long tail and, you know, all sorts of things. Um, it, it's obvious what, what went on. Um, and the Democrats do that. Now, now, just to say the truth, they're actually, they don't do it nearly as much and they're really not very good at it. The Republicans, it's a state of art operation. Uh, and they have done it all over the country in every place where they have the state legislature, they've basically... Uh, implemented a, a gerrymandered uh, uh, district system. Um, so what we need is to make sure that Democrats actually are pressured into adopting nonpartisan redistricting. And I'll tell you why. It's not only it's not only a good policy for the short term, but it's more lasting because when it is some, it, it's extremely popular with voters of all all parties. It's across the spectrum. Everybody gets that elected officials should not be able to draw districts that benefit incumbents. The voters get to decide who the elected officials are. The elected officials don't get to decide who their voters are. It just can't work that way. So if the Democrats will adopt, you know, they're all scared, right? Incumbents hate change. So they don't want to adopt systems that are fairer, that are 
nonpartisan because they're afraid they might lose. But actually, you would argue that they are more likely to win. I mean, it happened in California, and the Democrats did all right. Similarly, another area where, where politicians are often scared is campaign finance reform. We need to push for that. People who care about real democracy need to invest themselves in, in fighting for clean money campaigns. Look, we, ca we care about wealth inequality in this country. How can we then depend on plutocrats to fund this important work or to fund campaigns? Similarly, you know, I think those of us, you know, who are involved in national politics, you know, have, have you know, so I used to think there are a lot of norms, a lot of norms that govern how our elected officials behave. Um, it seemed sort of that was okay, and generally they sort of abided by them, more or less, right? I don't say they did it completely, but, you know, there were things that we didn't really think about, like the president releasing his tax returns and stuff like that. Well, I guess we've all learned norms are not enough. <laughs> we actually need something more solid than that. So we, we need to push for strong anti-corruption laws and a revitalized government ethics system to ensure that lobbyists and wealthy donors and elected politicians aren't abusing our democratic process. And, you know, as a lawyer, I believe very much that we need to come back to our First Amendment and rethink that jurisprudence. And part of this is going to be helped by a different set of judges in the future. But look, money and speech are just not the same. The Constitution actually is a democracy-enhancing document, not one that suppresses it. So that means not just Citizens United being overturned, but the whole litany of cases, starting with Buckley v. Vallejo, which went down this ridiculous tangent of saying that our speech can be overridden by the speech of somebody who's got more money than we do. That's not the way a democracy is supposed to work. That's why we need courts that are fair and representative with even-handed rules. Judges who are, to have judges who are not biased against victims of corporate or government wrongdoing, we actually need judges who are not picked and coached by conservative interests. Now, there are a lot of people, including myself, who are uncomfortable with judicial elections. But guess what? They happen. So we have to participate. We cannot cede that battlefield. So step one is to fight like hell to advance, elect, and support good judges. That, that means progressive donors to political candidates have to actually demand that the Democrats care. Now, as I said, I worked in the Senate for many years I worked in the Clinton White House, also on judicial nominations, and there is such an asymmetry. There is such an asymmetry between Democrats and Republicans in terms of how much energy they put into the judicial nominations battle. I mean, you could barely get the Democratic senators to show up in the, to the Judiciary Committee hearings. Well, look, so we need, we need to, to push them. They need to be pushed. But there, we also have to do what the right has done so well, and my organization is invested in, is we've got to have a, a cohort of progressive and diverse, okay, that didn't happen on the right, not diverse on their side, but we need diverse judges. Diverse judges, we need to develop a whole group of people who are ready to be nominated. We can't just be passive about this stuff anymore. And we have to provide them with the kind of well-thought-out legal policy that will help them. So look, I, I do not believe that it's in our values to behave the way that Steve Bannon does, or Karl Rove, or God forbid, Ann Coulter. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not who I think we want to be. And we believe in progress, right? If we're progressives, and maybe some of you aren't, so forgive me. Um, but, we, you know, I, the Constitution starts with we the people. And I, I, I remember, re, remind people, they shouldn't jump right to the Bill of Rights or the Article Three or whatever it is. Read the preamble. We the people, in order to form a more perfect 
union. Well, that's what I think we should be about, not descending to the depths of those right-wing operatives, but just because we believe in those values doesn't mean we don't fight. To the contrary, we have to fight even harder. And fight, and we fight for power and not just for policies. So, you know, my experience, I worked on the Hill. I was from my first job out of college. I was a policy staffer on the House side. I worked on a presidential campaign. I worked on a Senate campaign. I worked in the Senate as a staffer. I practiced law for a couple years. Um, I was the lead lobbyist for the ACLU. I have been around Washington, and I, you know, I guess you, know, I, you can tell by now, <laughs> bear the battle scars. But I have seen absolutely up close just how much more the right understands that when you have power, you use it to build power for the long term. And unless the left and progressives grasp that truth, our mantra as Americans is going to have to be power to the plutocrats, not power to the people. So thanks so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. And I, I, I know uh, Sydney said earlier that if you have a question, you should use the microphone, because we have people taping and everybody else can hear you. So. Uh. Thank you. I'm wondering um, how close do you think we have come or could come to a constitutional convention among the states to, uh, to amend the Constitution? Uh -huh. I believe it takes 34 state legislatures to convene yes. that, right? And then a, a vote of 38 um, to, to yeah. actually so, affect uh, it. It's something I think would be a really dangerous idea right now. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I, guess I, I told you the math about how many state legislatures the Republicans control. They're actually putting a lot of money, the Koch brothers at all. What was that number that you, that you cited? Uh, it was, it's, it's 30 that they control both houses. Okay. And they need um, 34. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's close. And they're putting a lot of money into it. And I'll tell you why. Because initially, a lot of the drive behind this was for a balanced budget amendment. So the federal government, as you know, unlike a lot of the states, does not have a balanced budget. Uh, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that, right? It gives a lot more flexibility for, for providing social programs and, you know, uh, and it would enable, it would force massive cuts in social because you have the, the entitlement programs, which you can't touch, and nobody, right? The Democrats, too, nobody ever wants to touch the defense budget. So by the time you have, you know, Social Security and Medicare and the defense budget, you Cut. Anyway, so I, that's one of the major drivers. There are some, there are some people on the left who are, are pushing for a constitutional convention, which they argue would enable a, a first, the First Amendment to be changed or some addition to it that would outlaw or would reverse Citizens United, right? Or say the corporations are not people or something like that. But the danger is, um, you know, and I, I, I think this is quite an interesting. We have never had a constitutional convention in this country, uh, except for one. So the Articles of Convention, of, uh, the Articles which were of Confederation, which were adopted before the Constitution, um, they weren't working, right? There was not enough power in the federal government. It couldn't function. So they went to a convention. And in, in theory, they were just supposed to tinker. And they threw the whole thing out and adopted the US Constitution, right? So there is nothing. There's no history that says, you know, which is why I think there's a lot of naivete, uh, as much as I agree that Citizens United was a terrible decision, naivete to think that you could go to a constitutional convention, it's going to be dominated by the Republican states. We don't know how it would actually run, but we certainly don't have any, any reason to think that it would only address Citizens United, even if you had enough calls from state legislatures to that. So anyway, yes, I, I, it's, it's worrying to me. Um, I don't think they're... They're, they've had some setbacks on the right because there's been better organizing by progressives who understand the dangers and they, some of them understand math. The math is not on our side to fix Citizens United that way right now. So anyway, thank you. It's a great question. Great. Thank you. Now, I know this is Seattle. You're curious people. You must have questions. <laughs> um, the left has 
um, large donors and very wealthy people, but why aren't they getting organized? Uh, why? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, uh, um, so there have been some efforts, and there was a group called the Democracy Alliance, um, which was really set up because it was meant to be the answer to the kind of Powell memo organizing. Um, and, and there's somebody I know who actually developed a PowerPoint. So that's how you make, that's how you pr con convince progressives to do something, right? You show them a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, and it, it outlined, you know, sort of what the right had done and sort of how the, and, but it's never, ever resulted in that. And, 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 and I'll tell you why. Um, and part of it is this, it is anti, it, 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 every donor has their own pet project. Um, they're, they're all smarter than the next, and um, you know, they can't really, they don't really coalesce around um, uh, funding imperatives. And they're very much focused on, you know, sort of there's a, on the next election. And they forget that the whole point of this is to focus on the long term. Of course we have to care about the next election. But you've got to care about, just like Karl, Karl Rove, he knew that red map wasn't just important for that election, it was actually gonna be important for every single election for the next 10 years. And he was right. He was right. That's why in so many states in this country where you had a blue wave and a, and a, and a blue supermajority, you have a blue minority elected. So it's really frustrating. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's, there have been studies, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the, you know somebody said to me, um, you know, that the, who spent a lot of time in philanthropy on the left, that, um, you know, that on the right, you know, human beings who need help you know, who are, who, are, who, are, who are on some kind of a social program, you know, people with children or, you know, who are hungry or need housing because they're homeless, you know, those people are treated terribly. You know, you're given short term, you know, and then you gotta get off the program and cut them off. But they're, they, they, they have a totally different attitude towards the groups that they fund, which they say, you know, whatever, you don't have to prove that you did anything. We'll look at you in 10 years and see if you're successful. You know, they know that change takes a long time. Now on the left, you know, theory, in theory, people are much more, you know, supportive of, of, of social programs to help people in difficult situations, but to the groups that they fund, they have these crazy metrics where you have to prove like every quarter that you've, you've changed the world and they cut, they have one year grants. If you get a two year grant, you're amazingly successful. The idea of having funding for the long term, you know, o the Olin Foundation has been a long term funder uh, of the Federalist Society, which was the counterpart to my organization, which uh, is infamous right now for all the work they're doing on the Trump judiciary and Leonard Leo, who's their executive vice president, who's been quite a bit in the press. Um, well, the head of the Olin Foundation, you know, was this, the same person who was describing right, uh, how liberal philanthropy works, uh, who's in the philanthropy world, said he'd ask the guy, James Pearson, who is the head of the Olin Foundation, he says, well, how do you know that your groups are successful? He said, you know, I read the paper. You know, if I see things going in the right direction, I figure things are okay. You know, I'll keep funding them, you know, <laughs> instead of, anyway, it is a huge problem, but we're working on it. Um, I, you know, I think there are certain things that are starting to gel. Um, you know, very, very asymmetric um, funding in terms of engagement on the courts, as I said, but um, Brett Kavanaugh, for all the terrible things about Brett Kavanaugh, has actually kind of made people real, realize. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's kind of important, that branch. That has a lot of impact, so anyway. Um, yes, you have a question. Um, what about the Electoral College? That is also another great question. So I talk about a number of reforms in the book, which um, will be for sale shortly, hopefully. Some of you might want to buy it, and I'm happy to sign it. Um, the national popular vote is actually a really interesting response to that, because the Electoral College, like, like the Senate, um, is, is very skewed um, in terms of Rural and the whitest states in the country get an overweening uh, ability to choose our president. Um, so there is this, uh, a proposal um, that um, is, is quite intriguing that I think Washington State has supported. Um, it's passed in quite a number of states. And the idea is that the states would agree, um, once you have a, a number of states whose electoral votes uh, would equal uh, a majority, um, they would, they'd agree that no matter how their state went, they would award their electoral votes to the national popular vote winner. So I actually think that's, that's an incredibly important, clever, uh, and constitutional reform that does not require an amendment of the Electoral College. 
It works through the compact clause of the Constitution. It's great. Anyone who's not familiar with it, the National Popular Vote, you can find it online. Great organization. Yes. Hello. Um, so I'm wondering, you talk a lot um, in the long term and systemic level um, and you know, seeing that and using that as the pathway to positive change um, and ultimate um, success in democracy, but wondering from an individual citizen's perspective, mm -hmm. um, what are things that we hear today um, can take away as individual people who want to work toward that long term yes. to do? Absolutely. Well, I mean, one thing is to be, so number one, the courts are really a vital piece of this. And I think a lot of us sort of take for granted or just assume they're neutral, they're fine, as you know, as Chief Justice Roberts said, we're just umpires, <laughs> except, <laughs> except somehow when the decisions affect, you know, the Republican Party, like Shelby County, which destroyed the Voting Rights Act and Citizens United, and you name it. Um, uh, but so there is a real imperative to have the same kind of energy and push the senators to actually care about who their nominees are, to fight for them. Um, but then also, I think that actually things are, are you know, I'm, a little, I'm somewhat optimistic. Um, the first bill that was introduced by the new majority in the, in the House, H.R. 1, actually is really structured that way, to look at sort of systems. You know, how do you really make elections work for all eligible voters? You know, how do we, how do we actually address the, the sort of the, 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 the barriers that have been imposed? Um, how do we create um, infrastructure for fair districts? So what they, they were really looking at the pieces and also ethics in government. Uh, it's not an oxymoron, and it should not be, but it is right now. So they also have um, you know, pieces of the bill that are addressing that. But I, so I think it is being supportive of that kind of work. And at the local level, um, there is a lot of ability to make change of this kind. Now you're in Seattle, so um, you know you're you're in a place that is you know so much above you know head and shoulders above so many places in terms of the kinds of of, of de democratic infrastructure you have, and I mean democratic with a small d. Um, but you know being ambassadors for that, um, engaging in that, making it better. There are other parts of Washington State that could be better. Um, I think is really vital. But thanks for that question. Yes. Um, what do we do about the judges that are being appointed? Anything and, and, and what do you think about the proposals that have been floating around about reconfiguring yes. the Supreme Court? Well, um, okay, so, so um, just to point, um, there are several proposals and um, I think they're very interesting. I, you know, number one, the Constitution does not actually set a number of justices to serve on the Supreme Court or, or the federal courts generally. And that number has changed. So there are some people who, who argue um, President Obama was denied a seat. No other president has nominated somebody who never got a hearing. It just never happened before. And Mitch McConnell made up some cockamamie thing like, oh, it's, a, it's an election year. Of course, when he's asked what happens if there's a vacancy during Trump's election year, it's like, well, of course we can nominate and confirm somebody. Um, isn't that convenient? Um, so the expanding the court is an option. Um, Merrick Garland, you know, that seat was stolen, as people say, it was stolen. Um, the response would be, you can expand the size of the Supreme Court. Um, and actually, what's interesting is there's the, the, one of the founders of the Federalist Society, uh, a law professor named Stephen Calabresi, wrote a law review article that he put up on his website for a little while. It's actually, uh, I don't think it was published in a law review, but he wrote a paper. Um, about how there need to be this radical expansion of the federal courts overall, including the administrative law judges that are not supposed to be part of the political process at all, making them part of the same process. Radical expansion in the argument, he said, was we need to undo the Obama legacy. Now, that, we took a screenshot of that, so we have that document, but it, it came off his website pretty quickly. But that's what they're, so that's their agenda, right? That's what they wanna do, so Donald Trump can, can add like another third to the federal judiciary of people like Brett Kavanaugh, who think that most of us don't have any rights if we're not a corporation, if we're not you know, a right-wing Christian, you know, there's nothing for us. Um, so so there's, you know, the expanding the court is one idea. Now another one that I think is actually quite interesting, and actually, strangely enough, Stephen Calabresi was also the source of this one, 
Um, there's an idea to have term limits for Supreme Court justices. Now, you know that, that uh, the, the, the Constitution does say that judge, the justices, the judges, federal judges generally serve during good behavior. Um, but it, what it doesn't say, and so that's been interpreted as life, as, as life tenure. Um, so not disputing that. But what, so, but what it doesn't say in the Constitution is what kind of service it would be. And mo in the federal judiciary, um, other judges take senior status. And uh, in fact, you know, that uh, happens all the time, creates a new vacancy and they fill it. So why couldn't you have senior status for Supreme Court justices and impose an 18-year term? Now, what Stephen Calabresi said was, he looked at the history, and he said, you know, justices are serving a really long time now. You know, they get nominated, and they're on there forever. Um, 18 years is sort of the historical average, so why wouldn't that, wouldn't that be a good, a good amount of time? You know, that's pretty long. 18 years is pretty long to start with, but so there's a whole proposal around that that I think is quite interesting. Partly for me, and this is not probably what Stephen Calabresi is worried about, but I think the court has gotten way out of bounds in terms of the amount of power it has. As you've had the right-wing activists who've decided that they and nobody else gets to determine not, you know, what the Constitution <laughs> says and override Congress in a more and more blatant way, um, undoing all sorts of major statutes, that's, a little, that's frightening for a democracy, right? Nine people who serve for life, being able to undo the work of a, of a state legislator. In fact, when they, when, they, when they undid most of the Voting Rights Act, Justice Scalia actually said, you know what, the fact that almost everybody in Congress voted for it shows that there's a problem with it. I mean, can you imagine that? It was almost a unanimous vote in, front of the, in, in favor of the Voting Rights Act for, for Justice Scalia. That was an argument, it was unconstitutional. I mean, really. So, I think some of these proposals are extremely interesting. There's a whole variety of other ones that are a little bit more creative, um, maybe a little harder to implement, but these are a couple that I think are, are quite good. Now, what can we do about the judges on the bench right now? That is a problem. However, if the left, the progressives, and people who just care about fair judges, I mean, which I think includes a vast swath of of sort of moderate to, to maybe even some people on the right actually believe in that. You know, there should be a, a real upsurge in activism around um, getting the elected officials to care about, about having nominees who represent those values. Um, and there will be a time, you know, because, you know, Donald Trump um, has, well, maybe only a year left. We'll see. Eight years for us? Um, and so there'll be time to sort of counterman. If, if, however, two terms, that's, that's hard. That's hard. You know, he's nominating, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm fond of Barack Obama, but he nominated a lot of rather elderly, I mean, not elderly, but older uh, people, um, uh, and actually a fair number of corporate lawyers and prosecutors who are all fine. I have no problem with either one of those categories, but I think we really need a, a much more diverse background in terms of you know, people who actually, lawyers who've represented people in the courtroom who have been, or, you know, public defenders, and, uh, you know, it's an, just an important to have that. I mean, he, Barack Obama was very good at diversity, the demographic diversity, um, except for, for younger people. A lot of his nominees were on the older side. Now, Donald Trump is not, is not doing that. His nominees, you know, I, they're, 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 they're over 20, you know, you're like, oh, they're out of law school. <laughs> But that's about all you can say for them. They've passed the bar, uh, maybe. Yeah, they passed the bar. They had to pass the bar. But they're, you know, there's a long future for them on the court. So another lesson to learn. So yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, do you think the left is generally not focusing enough on state legislatures in comparison to national legislatures? And do you think, um, are there any strategies or tactics that you see in taking back those state legislatures? Yeah, so you know, I'd say, um, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, other types of infrastructure besides the electoral, um, but yes. Um, and ALEC, which I mentioned before, is a great example of that. There's no real ALEC on the, on the left. Uh, you know, and state legislators are hungry for help. You know, most of them, and any of you know people um, in Olympia, you know, you know 
they're just, they're out there by themselves. You know, they have very little staff, they have very little assistance. And on the right, they're getting all this stuff, you know, they're being fed bills and talking points and policy papers and everything. And they're, so a variety of groups have tried to get started and they kind of fizzle out and there's no support for them. It is vital. Now, I, just, I was just in, in, in Portland yesterday, and I happened to have lunch with a great guy who just got elected to the city council in Gresham. Gresham is you know, right outside of Portland, and, it, and it's been you know, kind of more conservative um, uh, than Portland. Um, and, you know, but he actually went out of his way, he campaigned. Um, he is uh, proudly out of the closet, um, a Latino, um, and just, you know, was, you know, was just, he, he did a, ran a very smart campaign, engaged, and he's working now to get other um, people elected uh, to school boards and all sorts of things. But what he said was, he, he, he doesn't have, he doesn't know who to ask for help. You know, nobody, you know, so it's tough enough with state legislatures. Imagine local electeds. So this is another part of the infrastructure that, you know, I, there are billionaires who do a lot of investing in progressive causes. If they just focus and collectively say, you know, the courts, the state legislatures, the electoral systems, uh, campaign finance system, you know, these are places we're going to put a lot of money into, and they can still have, they're still, I mean, they're billionaires, right? They can still have pet projects, um, and, the, and the elections are a key piece of that, and, and there is just so much more money on the right. It's not glamorous, not like congressional elections, it's, you know, presidential elections, they all, you know, the, not all, I mean, you know, I shouldn't say that there's certainly some very brilliant and wonderful and supportive progressive donors. But there are too much focus on the glamour and the glitz and not enough on the hard work, getting those people elected at the local level. And I said, my organization is trying to build a pipeline of, of lawyers, um, progressive, diverse, um, who are ready to be judges. You know, you try telling somebody about leadership development and raising money for it. You know, it's like, I know I'm talking about people who are not gonna be judges for 15, 20 years. Believe me, though, if I don't start working with them now, they're all going to go, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be lost to us, you know, and we're not going to get these people nominated, confirmed, and the other side will. So anyway, thank you for that question. It looks like we are out of questions, so thank you all.